let me just introduce Ramin. So, I, 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 so everyone who's joined, I think it's just a real treat to have um, Ramin here, uh, Dr. Abari. So he's a principal engineer with the Renewable Energy Group. You have over 30 years experience as chemical engineer, experience in hydrogenation and polymerization technologies, uh, has held engineering positions with ExxonMobil, General Electric, and WR Grace. And he's a uh, named inventor on over 43 patents and um, co-author of several peer-reviewed technical papers about bio-based chemical process and fuels. And uh, he received his master's degree from City College of New York, bachelor's in chemistry from the College of Worcester, and is registered professional engineer in the state of Oklahoma and a member of AICHE, American Chemical Society and American Society of Testing Materials. But one of the things that I have learned about you over the years is that you are quite an artist and I really enjoy your artwork and the work you've done with the graphic novels to tell a story. So um, thank you for, for that passion uh, for safety and, and art, so. Um. Thank you for that introduction, John. It's, it's an honor to be here uh, and presenting to your class. Um, let me just start with a quick show and tell before switching to the presentation mode. This, what I'm showing, uh, I hope it comes through uh, in the video, is called a bellow. It's, uh, it's a device used um, in, to, uh, as a, uh, in piping between, uh, vessels and pipe, pipe spools and pipe segments uh, for thermal expansion. So when uh, the vessel gets hot or uh, it allows for the pipe to expand and contract when it gets cold or respond to that. But you can see that the expansion uh, and contraction only go in, uh, in one axis, uh, this way and back, back, forward and backward, but not sideways. So keep that in mind as we get towards the last few slides of this presentation, when we get to the what went wrong, as we lead to the what went wrong, this is one of the, uh, was the point of failure. So please let me uh, share my PowerPoint. And if you cannot see it, let me know. You should be looking at the, uh, presentation called Flixboro Lessons of, from a Petrochemical Plant Disaster. Yes, yes it's coming through. Thank you. If I can see it. Um, the uh, Flixboro disaster, as it's known, uh, is very, is, is considered one of the most transformative petrochemical uh, incidents in Europe, especially in the UK where it occurred because of the impact it, it had in the how uh, uh, petrochemical plants and control rooms and everything else was associated with those facilities were designed in Europe uh, uh, towards the starting in the mid late 70s. Uh, this, re this accident occurred in 1974. However, it's not very well known in the US. Very few people uh, outside of the process the safety field know about the uh, Flixboro disaster. Um, and instead of just giving you just a case study like a, a CSV video, which just focuses on the timeline leading to the accident itself, I'm gonna take you back way back in the timeline so that we can go back to the original uh, the product a, a that was made in that plant and the, all the dynamics and all the decisions that, uh, that were made along the line uh, that uh, contributed not only to the plant's construction, uh, not only to the plant's uh, um, operation and failure ultimately, but also to its design and, uh, and its siting and everything else. So let's so uh, I hope you don't mind uh, the little bit of a history lesson because I think it's quite germane to the, uh, to the accident itself. Uh, so we, I was, we start our story in 1935. That's when uh, DuPont invents nylon. DuPont uh, actually um, recruited 
this bright scientist who was a young professor in Harvard University by the name of uh, Wallace Carothers, who at the time was uh, writing uh, essentially what became, uh, became the uh, scientific foundation of polymer uh, science. At the time, polymer uh, synthesis uh, was just more of a, a curiosity or a, a more of an art than a science. While uh, characters were actually writing papers about mechanisms, about chain growth, what was uh, how to make that happen, and Dupont very astutely uh, 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 recruits him, and and he and du uh, he does invent other polymers at Dupont, but basically Dupont asked them that we want synthetic silk, and he delivers spectacularly. He knew quite well that silk was just a protein of uh, protein uh, of fibers. Essentially, protein is uh, polymers of amino acid or polyamide. So he knew he had to synthesize a polyamide and just make sure that it was uh, had the very very high uh, uh, polymer uh, chain length, molecular weight. The way he went about it was that he, uh, oh, I didn't mention, but this is important too, that, that uh, the inventor, uh, Wallace Carothers, uh, committed suicide two years after his invention uh, because he suffered from uh, clinical depression. And DuPont, uh, because of that, because they wanted nylon to be associated with a, you know, with a household product and did not want anybody to think of the company as being a, uh, associated with a suicidal inventor, they um, just hid his name. So his name was not in the uh, archives, although anybody who looked at the patents, uh, original patents would knew who the inventor, who the only named inventor was. But it wasn't until the mid eighties when uh, clinical depression was much better understood that DuPont embraced his legacy as their, probably one of their brightest inventors ever. Um, so, uh, uh, the uh, chemistry of, uh, of uh, DuPont's uh, nylon synthesis was to copolymerize uh, 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 a dicarboxylic acid with a diamine to make this uh, uh, polyamide um, polymer. And, uh, and, and mainly they use adipic acid and hexamethylene diamine to make nylon 66, which was called nylon 66 because uh, there is six uh, uh, carbon uh, carbons per per every repeating unit, um, and uh, in addition to the long uh, um, length of the polymer uh, uh, molecules, uh, uh, the strength of the nylon comes from these uh, um, uh, hydrogen bonds that exist between the. Uh, the hydrogen of the amine group and the oxygen of the uh, carbonyl group in the, in the polymer. And again, the uh, Wallace Carther recognized that that's what made uh, silk what it is. Um, but DuPont wasn't the largest chemical company in the world. It was the largest chemical company in the US, but at the time, the largest chemical company in the world and the fourth largest uh, company of all categories in the world was IG Farben in, uh, in Germany, uh, all through the uh, mid 20s through the end of World War II. Um, and they uh, uh, already were making uh, lots of synthetic, uh, they were fascinated by taking everything that occurred naturally and developing a synthetic path, pathway through, uh, to it because the vision of Germany at the time, which fit nicely into the Nazi uh, uh, nationalistic vision of Germany was that they were gonna be self-sufficient. So for example, rubber, which at the time was only available naturally from rubber trees in Southeast Asia or, 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 uh, or South America, they did not, they found a synthetic way of making the rubber using uh, what Germany had, which was coal. And, uh, and, and similarly with fuels, uh, with uh, diesel and aviation gasoline. And, and, and so the, uh, the idea of synthetic silk very much appealed to them. It fit their business model perfectly. So they invented, but they, so they monitored the DuPont patents quite closely 
and found a very elegant way around the DuPont patents. So instead of uh, copolymerizing uh, 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 a diamine and a, a dicarboxylic acid, they homopolymerized uh, a, a, a cyclic polyamide by just a chain, uh, a chain opening uh, polymerization, they managed to make the same type of a polymer, nylon, uh, except that they would call it nylon six because it only had one, it was a homopolymer of one uh, uh, six chain, uh, um, six carbon chain monomer. Uh, uh, and so DuPont introduces uh, nylon commercially in 1939, and it revolutionizes the, uh, not only the company itself, but their sales skyrocketing and it's recreating itself as a consumer product, consumer goods product, but also the fashion industry. Uh, 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 stockings used to be uh, made out of silk and they were only affordable to the very rich. Uh, and so the, that stylish look that everybody wanted was suddenly affordable uh, and uh, to the general public through uh, nylon stockings. Uh, and, and that uh, uh, the real, I guess you could say, uh, uh, widespread ap uh, appeal didn't really take off because of World War II and the fact that that same nylon was found to be very good for uh, for military uses such as for um, parachutes and for reinforcing tires for trucks and uh, and so uh, their it's, its commercial um, uh, consumer use didn't really take off although in that pre-war years DuPont uh, 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 recognizing that uh, they had that threat from uh, IG Farben in Germany aggressively uh, used this patent position to find partners around the world. And in uh, UK, it formed a joint venture with, uh, with, uh, uh, with their largest chemical company, ICI, uh, to form what the, the DuPont venture there was called British Nylon Spinners, so they can essentially form the nylon monopoly there. Um, after the end of World War II and the uh, defeat of Nazi Germany, uh, many of the IG Farben's uh, managers were uh, tried in the Nuremberg trials for war crimes because of their cooperation with uh, Germany's uh, um, war machine and even their, uh, their concentration camps and, 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 uh, and, and uh, gas chambers. Uh, so. Uh, so as a punishment for uh, the company, the company was broken up uh, and the biggest component of IG Farben became BASF and uh, Bayer was, a, was the second largest component. And, uh, and um, their patents, uh, they were forced to, as a, a, uh, as a reparation for, uh, for, their, uh, for the Germany's war crimes, there were uh, an occupation of many European countries that they were forced to uh, uh, give up those patents and give those patents uh, to, uh, to the countries that they had occupied. For example, Holland and France and others. So for, so for Holland, Holland ended up with the, with the nylon six patents and the caprolactam patents. Uh, so the Dutch state mines, which got those patents, Use that uh, as a leverage to become to reinvent itself from a coal and coal-based chemical company to essentially a, 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 chemi a chemical company and a petrochemical company. Uh, um, so then, so looking at the 1950s synthetic fibers market, we have Dupont controlling the Americas with its patent uh, monopolies and the nylon six six. Uh, product and DS, DS, DSM and BASF dominated continental Europe with the uh, with the nylon six patents uh, and um, and UK was kind of uh, through the fifties it was a, a Dupont controlled um, patent area with nylon six six but because it was just across the English Channel from Europe. The, the English uh, uh, 
fabric companies could see that they could easily acquire, uh, buy the nylon six also and not be infringing on the DuPont patents. So that was about, so England was, a, was would become the only place in the world where you had two nylon, nylon products competing at the same time. And the place where the production of nylon six began was Flixboro in, in the, um, in, in uh, northeastern England, near this, uh, not too far from the Scottish border. Um, so, because of that uh, uh, competition for nylon, uh, and British textile companies' uh, um, um, desire to go further up that value chain and actually make nylon six themselves by, uh, by homopolymerization of caprolactam, you had a, and, and, and the, obviously the DuPont ICI monopoly not wanting to give up its, its, uh, its position, you had a price war. And so that created a, a very uh, exciting time for the fashion industry. Uh, and and uh, because they, they had access to very cheap nylon to experiment with nylon, not only for stockings and and uh, dresses, but for all you know, but for you know, gloves and everything else, and ties, and and so and and one of the beauties of nylon as a synthetic fiber is that it's it picks up its uh, you know its color you know that because of its polarity, its dyes are very easily in included. So nylon, uh, uh, are, it makes very colorful fabrics, which added to that, uh, if you will, the the fashion component of the singing swinging sixties. And um, so in this, with this background, DSM forms a, a joint venture in England called NIPRO, standing for nylon production uh, or something like that. And, uh, and they build a caprolactam plant in Flipsboro to cheaply supply caprolactam to the fibers industry for nylon six, which is there, uh, there without infringing on DuPont patents. Um, so, uh, so the first plant they built uh, in Flixboro made nylon uh, using, uh, I'm sorry, made, yeah, not a caprolactam and nylon using this top pathway, where starting with uh, phenol, which was the original uh, German uh, IG Farben process for making nylon six. Starting with, with phenol, you can hydrogenate phenol to, to get cyclohexanone which is then um, uh, treated with uh, hydroxyamine and sulfuric acid to convert it to caprolactam. And that caprolactam is then, as we discussed earlier, can be treated thermally to, to make the polymer. Um, uh, but uh, you know, phenol uh, was expensive uh, in the petrochemical value chain. Uh, cyclohexane was much, much cheaper, uh, uh, less than half the price. And so DSM in, in, uh, in, um, in Holland, in their corporate R&D center in Holland, they developed this uh, new process where you just take cyclohexane, which was increasingly available from petroleum refineries and uh, oxidizing it with essentially with air. Uh, and that reaction drives off water uh, uh, and uh, produces uh, uh, that same cyclohexanone intermediate, which then is, is readily converts into scaprolactam and nylon-6. Um, so their first uh, unit, uh, a production unit in uh, Flipsboro was the phenol hydrogenation, but they immediately decided that they were gonna uh, uh, build, uh, they were gonna showcase their new process uh, right there. Um, so they built a, a 50,000 uh, tons, a, uh, metric tons a year uh, um, cyclohexane oxidation plant. So the cyclohexane oxidation unit, uh, the process, the core of the process was this flow diagram. So the cyclohexane was essentially preheated uh, and, and converted through a series of six uh, CSTRs. Uh, uh, it was a continuous process using these stir tank reactors where uh, oxygen air was bubbled through each reactor 
and uh, and of course because they did not want to form a combustion a combustible vapor air mixture, they also had nitrogen coming in to dilute that air to ensure they would always stay below the LEL or the lower explosive limit, lower flammability limit for that, uh, so that there was no never a danger of a potential, you know, static charge ignition or any other form of uh, ignition there because you just did not have enough oxygen. But because of that, those conditions to ensure that uh, mild oxidation with minimal air usage, the reactor happened had to happen at relatively low temperatures uh, and and with uh, low uh, conversion per pass. So they had to uh, first of all. Uh, operate with these CSTRs in series. Uh, uh, and physically, how they, these reactors looked like was kind of like what is shown here, so that they were, uh, the, uh, the lead reactor was, on, uh, was elevated on top of the top of a stairs, if you will, because they're literally arranged in a step, stepwise manner. So the top, top of the stairs was R1, the next step down was R2 and so forth, all the way down to the ground level was R6. And they essentially, this cascade of uh, CSTRs, uh, the reactor just overflew from one to the other, to the other, to the other. So there was no level control. So fairly elegant process, minimal instrumentation, um, and it uh, ran well. Um, and between the reactors, that's where the bellows were. So these bellows that I showed you in the beginning uh, uh, were between each reactor to allow for thermal expansion of the reactors and, and, and still not, not create any stresses on the piping due to the, these mechanically agitated reactors. Even with all these reactors and all this, they still got only about um, a six to 7% conversion per pass. So uh, 93, 94% of that cyclohexane had to be recycled. So you would go through these distillation uh, frame where the cyclohexanone was separated from the, uh, from the unconverted cyclohexane, which would be recycled back, back around. So you can imagine that for every uh, gallon of uh, product produced, you had to recycle at least uh, about 10 gallons of, of, the, of the cyclohexane. Nonetheless, this was showcased as the low, low cost process for making nylon. So when this plant came online, this, this new process came online in June of 1973, at, and they reached their, their design rates. Uh, the the uh, DSM showcased this in their plant in, the, uh, in England, in Flixborough. But they, uh, but they were not planning on just become, being an uh, owner and operator. They also had their own licensing arm that, uh, that was called Stamicarbon. And, and they basically wanted to license this widely around the world. So this uh, Flixborough was indeed the showcase for this new process. And the plant ran fairly well, um, uh, you know, no operating issues uh, until uh, the, they had to make some process changes in response to what is known in the oil industry as the uh, first oil shock or the Arab oil embargo. So that happened in, in October through November of 1973. Uh, that's when in response to Western support of Israel in the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, Iraq, uh, who were uh, among the world's biggest oil producers at the time, uh, decided not to uh, export uh, crude oil to Western European countries that uh, supported Israel and the US. And uh, that included the UK. Uh, now, the UK at the time, even before this um, Arab-Israeli war broke out, was in the midst of a um, uh, of a, a coal miner uh, strike. It wasn't a full bl full uh, blown strike. It was a minimum workage strike. So the coal miners worked, but they did not work. They refused to work overtime. 
because they uh, wanted to renegotiate a contract that would give them a, a, a raise uh, reflective of the inflation of the time. And uh, the uh, conservative prime minister of, uh, of UK at the time, uh, Ted Heath, he uh, did not want to give in to the, uh, to, to the um, coal miners union. So he used this uh, Arab oil embargo as a bargaining chip to say that, well, now we don't have enough uh, uh, diesel to run, uh, run our, uh, our, some of our uh, power plants. So we need to run all our power plants on coal only. And so that would require more coal and so the union had to uh, give in to, uh, to in the response to this national emergency. However, the union uh, refused to budge. And, and so what they did then in the UK was that they said, that, well, in that case, all the uh, all, all energy intensive industries have to either cut back uh, production, their energy consumption or just run three days a week instead of, I guess, a five day a week uh, schedule. And, and so all factories. But in the case of NIPRO that was, uh, and petrochemical companies and uh, refineries that ran uh, continuously, then they couldn't go down a few days a week just for this uh, uh, energy efficiency measures that uh, the government imposed. They needed to find a way to cut back their energy consumption by 30%. So suddenly the plant was forced to come up, come up with a creative idea of how to reduce electricity by 30%. So the idea they came up with was that we're not gonna run the mechanical agitators on, on these uh, CSTRs. Uh, the thinking was that the air that they were gonna already sparge in for the, for the oxidation reaction provided enough turbulence that you did not need to have a mechanical agitation. They had done uh, some pilot plant studies that showed that was done. And there are indeed in the uh, petrochemical industry, there are indeed processes that uh, they, so they call them uh, bubble column reactors, that you just have your, uh, uh, your reactant is bubbling through and that creates enough agitation uh, to, you know, for, for there to be turbulence and heat transfer and mass transfer to get the, uh, uh, get the mixing you need and the conversion you need. So there was precedent for this, uh, but they hadn't run this plan that way. So I guess my first question for you guys in the audience is, if you put yourself in the, in the, uh, in the shoe of the engineers that were running this plant in England, and you were told you had to reduce 30%, and somebody came up with a bright idea of shutting down all the agitators, what, how would you uh, respond? Would you think this is a good idea or, 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 or would you think there is something needs to be uh, reconsidered? Al Alex uh, Kitan, you wanna share us your thoughts? How would you? Yeah, sorry. Um... <clears throat> So, I mean, if you shut down the agitators, I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess you'd have to think about uh, combustibility or whether or not mix or, you know, agitating or not agitating would cause the release of energy or not. And so I'm yeah. not into yeah, yeah, I mean they did kind of look into that. They were actually having uh, on the combustion air mixture, they all had analyzers so they could make sure they would never, these gases would always, you know, uh, oxygen was all, uh, always uh, below that combustible level. Um, so they decided to go forward with it, but, but there was some other aspect that they did not, they overlooked. Remember when I uh, described the, the whole cyclohexane oxidation, I mentioned that, uh, the water was a, was a byproduct of that reaction. When you, uh, when you mix oxygen with a, a hydrocarbon to make that carbonyl, uh, you have to drive, you have to uh, remove one uh, uh, um, 
you know, from the O2 molecule, you have to move, uh, move one mole of that uh, uh, dioxygen as water in the form of H2O, while the other oxygen atom in the uh, O2 molecule sticks to the hydrocarbon chain to make that uh, cyclohexanone product. So that's what they overlooked was that, yes, you do, do, you do indeed uh, create good mixing uh, when you put in the, uh, put in the air, um, um, you know, for, and that creates agitation, but, uh, but not, but when you stop agitation, the water uh, settles to the bottom. So, but let's for now put ourselves still in the shoe of the people who are operating the, the plant. So what happened was that basically, uh, so they continued to run that way. They did not see any issues um, until they, until January of 1974, when the strike was over and the, uh, the oil embargo was over, the, the, the power uh, supply in the UK was back to normal. And, and so uh, the factories did not need to operate under uh, reduced rates. Uh, or reduce uh, power consumption. So they went, went to restart their uh, agitators and they noticed that one of the uh, agita agitators wouldn't turn on. And they found that was, it was because the shaft was bent. Uh, so they decided uh, for this R4 reactor. So they decided to go ahead and pull that uh, uh, um, agitator uh, out uh, for for them to re-straighten it and and uh, and and just uh, they basically uh, blind flanged that R four reactor and they decided to go ahead and run without agitation. Uh, uh, but I mean running that R four without agitation because it had no more any agitator left. The agitator was bent; it wasn't working. Whereas the other uh, other five were still working okay. So they uh, so at this point. Most reasonable people would agree that, well, we ran for uh, 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 from November to January without, uh, without agitation and we ran well. Now that we have agitation in, uh, in uh, five out of six reactors and one of them doesn't have an agitator, that shouldn't create a problem. So they, they went ahead and they ran this way uh, for another three months uh, un until in uh, March 30th uh, of 1974, they noticed that they, one of the reactors lost containment. They, they shut down uh, this R5 reactor, which was the one right after the one with no agitator. So they, they, uh, they examined it and found out that there was uh, a, a, a crack in the reactor, which was caused by stress corrosion cracking. The crack was right at the at the inlet flange. So basically, where you go from R4 to R5 was where this large crack was developed, the 30-inch crack. Um, they, uh, they they checked all the other reactors for stress corrosion cracking. They did not see any signs of any kind of corrosion. So they decided to go and just remove that reactor. Uh, the R5 reactor where, where you, they had a crack in the vessel and, uh, and instead uh, uh, just run, run with five reactors in series. They had shown, they had seen that they could still get uh, um, most, most of the conversion uh, through the five, uh, five reactors in series instead of six reactors in series. They may have seen a marginal reduction in, in, in output, but it was considered to be uh, minor but it allowed them to just get up and running, which is what their uh, marketing people wanted and their customers wanted. So, uh, but what they did though, was that they in, uh, recall that these reactors were on downstairs, uh, were on a staircase of sorts. So in order, so you couldn't connect R4 to R6 with a straight chain pipe. With a, so they had to use a, a, some type of a bent pipe uh, that they called it the, the, the bypass pipe or a, or a um, dog leg pipe because it was bent like a dog leg. Uh, so now you can see that you still have these bellows at the two ends 
but instead of reactors, uh, a reactor supporting uh, the, the straight end of the bellows, now you have this bent pipe at the both ends of those bellows. Ramin, can I uh, interject a, cup, a question? Yes. So <clears throat> were these reactors hung from uh, the, the midsection or from the top or were they sitting on a base? They were sitting on a base, on a concrete pad that were, you know, in uh, varying elevations from high to low. So essentially what happened with this, uh, uh, this, uh, with this dog leg pipe or bypass pipe that replaced the R5 reactor was that it, uh, it, they just had some scaffolding there where it sat on. So it wasn't, it wasn't bound to anything. They they kind of intuitively knew that they needed to have some give there, uh, but they didn't really understand. There, this was not subjected to any mechanical review. That these, uh, it was just process engineers, chemical engineers like you and me kind of came up with this uh, uh, creative uh, way to keep running. Um, yeah, uh, does it answer the question? Yes, that's, that's it, and I, I was gonna, also ask how that dog leg was supported apparently. Yeah, um, exactly. I kind of thought we are going there. Yeah, <laughs> it was just scaffolds, you know, because they uh, had just pulled that, uh, pulled the old vessel out that was uh, uh, damaged. And the plan was to replace it. So they left the scaffolding there and they uh, um, pipes it there. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened, but I somehow went back to the beginning. Um, so yeah, so now, uh, it, so what happened then in, um, um, uh, on, on, uh, on, then they ran for two months with this, uh, with this arrangement and, and they seemed to have run okay. There was no issues. Uh, however, after two months, uh, they needed to shut down ju uh, just to, uh, to for something completely unrelated. They had to fix a, uh, a leak in the sight glass at the downstream separator. So for that, they, they shut down the, the air to the reactors temporarily. And then when they came back up, um, uh, that's when uh, the incident happened. So let's see how the startup was uh, proceeding. So the way they would start up now, so you, you would not start the reactors with the air bubbling in. So this reactor, which was not agitated, was, uh, did, not have the, uh, did not have air bubbling in to create agitation. However, when it was shut down, it was shut down with a layer, with, with the water settled in the bottom of that, uh, the reactor. So you had cyclohexane and water, and then and and these other guys were agitated, but there was no air injection. And air was the only way to create that uh, agitation in in R four, not in R one, R two, and R three, and R six because they all had agitation. So they were running this way, and they were heating up the system. But but this uh, but whenever they would get to close to the uh, their uh, temperature that they were allowed to start oxygen uh, air uh, injection, they would see the sudden uh, pressure spike. And the uh, standard operating procedure was fairly clear that they, the operators were not supposed to start uh, that air injection until they were at uh, uh, 310 degrees F with uh, cyclohexane uh, circulation at their uh, operating rate of 550 gallons a minute. But, ever, but like I said, when they got to near that 310, at around 280, they would see a spike in pressure. Uh, however, they still managed to run this way because uh, that was what the guidelines were. Uh, but this was the first time they were starting with all reactors being agitated except for one, which presumably had now all the set, settled water in it. So now the PSV for the, uh, for the system 
was set at 165 psi gauge. So uh, that was the uh, relief valve. And this bypass uh, uh, valve, uh, bypass uh, pipe, the dog leg pipe, was only pressure tested at 150 uh, psi, which was still higher than their operating pressure, you know, substantially higher than the 125 psi gauge, but it was was not protected by the uh, by the safety valve. So during startup, while they were in this ho uh, hot circulation mode. At specifically at 4:53 p.m. on June uh, 1st, 1974, that's when they the this bypass pipe just blew off. Uh, people who the few witnesses who survived said that it started to squirm at the bellows, and as you guys remember from the uh, uh, the the bellow description in the beginning, these bellows were not designed to go. Uh, sideways. They were only designed to expand uh, uh, laterally or, you know, uh, forward and backwards. So something, they started, for whatever reason, they, they these uh, bellows started to move uh, squir in a squirming mode around the pipe and, and, and it blew off and 20,000 gallons of flashing cyclohexane uh, were released that within a minute later uh, formed a vapor cloud and it ignited uh, and uh, 28 of the operators uh, were immediately killed and uh, hundreds of others were injured, including both the uh, operate, uh, you know, people in the plant as well as people in the community, people in the neighbor neighborhood. Um, the leading explanation is that pool of water in that unagitated R4 that it, uh, that it violently erupted during that uh, startup heat up mode where, uh, where it wasn't agitated and that water just kind of would, uh, would not uniformly evaporate, it would just suddenly erupt, boil over and would cause the cyclohexane to erupt violently and hit the uh, hit the bypass pipe and caused that, you know, that movement that was observed around that, uh, the bellows of that uh, uh, bypass pipe. The, the, and this whole settled water hypothesis also explains uh, the failure of the R4 agitator the first time around uh, when they, uh, when, when, because you had uh, most water in that whole uh, uh, series reactors, uh, the water was highest in the fourth reactor just because of the conversion curve. Uh, and, and that was where you had this uh, agitator when, where presumably when they had all, when they would start, uh, start the agitation and restart for whatever process upset, that would create uh, this stress on the agitator shaft that caused that agitator to fail. And also the the uh, st stress corrosion corrosion cracking that, that provided the stress also this water eruption on the inlet of R5 where you had that stress develop. So again, this settled water hypothesis explains the unexplained unexplainable events leading up to that uh, disaster. So the key lessons at my last slide are. Uh, to take management of change seriously. There were uh, clearly the, 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 the plant uh, that we saw in the, the slide at the time of accident the, uh, was not the same plant that was designed uh, in the first slide I showed you with those CSTRs, with the six CSTRs with working agitators in series. The plant had become, had changed. So obviously the management of change was not done right. Uh, uh, the uh, second key lesson is try to understand the root cause of each incident, even if it wasn't a major thing, even if it was just a mechanical failure, like, uh, you know, like uh, why was an agitator working before and suddenly after not running it for a while, it's not working. Uh, there was no good explanation for that, or why was uh, why did this uh, stress corrosion crack develop in the inlet of one reactor and not on the other ones? There was no good explanation for it. 
So, um, so trying to understand before restarting is also a, a key learning from this. And finally, do not let deviation become normalized. We, I mentioned that uh, when during the period that uh, they ran uh, for the two months with the dog bone pipe uh, and the missing reactor, uh, I call that slide normalization of deviation because they kind of thought, well, even though originally we planned to just run for a few days until that reactor was fixed and replaced, uh, they ran for two months and they figured, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that was obviously uh, the wrong decision. So those are all, uh, uh, I, I consider those to be the main learnings from that incident. Look, I wonder if you could put that slide up again and maybe we could dialogue a little bit about those. Um, so when the first uh, sh failure of the, of the agitator, for um, so what your point about trying to understand the root cause of each accident, accident mechanical failure, were they? Um, it, so uh, perhaps the idea is that if they had understood that a little better, uh, yeah, you were. That's right. So this is where we started with, right? So you, you know, this is the process they started with, which ran very well, as far as we know. This there's no reason to believe they would have ever had an issue if they continued to run this way, but due to circumstances, some out of their control and some within their control, they ended up with this at the time of the accident, which is very different. Yeah, this is way way yeah. off of normal. <laughs> yeah, the, the normalization of deviation, and they ran, but then they ran for two months like this, and they, and they had no issue. They were making their their production targets. So, you know, you could see that if you're the plant uh, manager who is, uh, who is um, you know, who is, uh, whose performance uh, is, uh, and his bonus is tied to production uh, deadlines, he, he wants to continue running, you know, not to take a downtime to put the, put, put the agitator back or put the downtime to take put the, to the missing uh, reactor back. But that's so, to do in hindsight. 